Welcome everyone to tonight's special edition of the 80s Glam Metal Cast. It is the 50th episode spectacular. And now here he is, your host with the most. Wait for it. Here he is. It's Metal Boy. Well, thanks, Johnny, and thank you. What an audience. Wow. Wow. Well, hey, I don't know if you guys heard. I got some news. News about Gene Simmons. I don't know if you heard this. But because of COVID and no touring, Gene Simmons was very depressed. Very depressed. So he decided to go on a little vacation all by himself. He decided to go to the Virgin Islands. Okay? Now, he went there for a while. Let me just tell you, he's feeling a lot better. A lot better. And he's, he's left and he's gone home. But upon him leaving, they've had to change the name to just the islands. True story. True story. Well, hey, it's the 50th episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast. So, you know what? We got to celebrate. We have tricked 49 musical acts to believe that people actually listen to the show and they should come on to it. So, you know, that's, that was a big accomplishment. Well, hey, man, in all seriousness, we've got a stacked show for you tonight. We have got former lead vocalist of Shotgun Messiah, Zinni Zan. We're going to bring in the Kiss Man, the man who knows all about Kiss on Twitter, Bob Nash. We're also going to catch up with my good friend, original singer of Tiger Tail, Stevie James. And we're going to talk to some more buds from Twitter. We've got Richie Rich, and uh, with him we're going to discuss the age-old question. Creatures of the night or lick it up. And then we've got my bud Link, also known as Hoggers on Twitter. And what he's going to do is he's going to talk a little bit of Rock's Gang with me, and then he's going to flip the script and ask me a few questions. So that should be fun. So hope you all stay tuned and enjoy. Well, Zinni, welcome back to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you been, man? Thank you very much, Mike. I'm doing fine here in Sweden, in Stockholm, Sweden. Thank you. Good weather today in Alps, and I hope you're doing good in New York. Yeah, man, we're doing great. Um, so you had told me that you're working on some new music. Uh, it's going to be an English album, right? What's going on with that? Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely true, Mike. Uh, what I've been doing like these past three years is that I have been putting out three albums in, in my native language, Swedish, you know, just to, to do something something new, something that would have never been before, so, so to speak. So, and that's all fine and then, you know, I love that. And uh, But now I think it's time for, for me to, to uh, do a, a, new, a, a new English album. So I'm working on that right now, and I think it's going to be really released sometime, either right before Christmas or right after. Oh, that sounds awesome, because I actually thought all the stuff you did with Stagman was cool, but like I think I'd mentioned before, I couldn't understand the words, so I'll be, the English yeah. will be better for me, I'll, I'll be able to understand it, and, uh, and and really get into it, good. Cool, thank you very much for hearing. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Stagman thing, it's more, it's more also that I went a little bit through the, from the hard rock to, to, to some more, maybe singer songwriting, but, but basic rock and so on, with this new one from, uh, that I'm doing right now, it will be... Uh, more heavy than the Stagman stuff, but but that, that, that's that's I think that's really good, you know, you know, uh, keep yourself on the toes. Yeah, change it up. There's nothing wrong with that. So now, so hey, back in April there was an announcement that Shotgun Messiah was going to get back together with Harry and Tim. Do um, you want to publicly say anything about this? Like, are you involved? Uh, no, I'm not involved in that uh, at all, actually. And I saw the same thing, but then again. The COVID nineteen or the, the the virus came about, and from that I didn't hear anything. But I, I saw something as well, and that might absolutely be it. You know, that Tim and Harry are maybe starting up Shaka Messiah again, and it would be interesting to see what they would do. But but no, I'm not a part of that at all. Yeah, it was kind of weird because, uh, you know, first to really try to even do this during the virus, because it, I think that was announced in April and that we were pretty much into it pretty thick at that point. Um, you know, touring's hard. All that kind of stuff is hard to do right now. And I've seen no pictures, no announcements of dates or an album coming. So it was, it was kind of like it came out and then it's just kind of phased out. I haven't heard anything more about it. So it's kind of weird. Yeah, I must admit as well. And and again, as you said, I don't know the background about it. You know, we about two years ago, 
there was a possibility that, that we would uh, get to be, get back together with the original band, not to make an album or anything, but but to make uh, some festivals in Europe. Uh, so we we had we had conversations, we had meetings and so on and so forth with management and even contacted some festivals. Uh, pretty good, but for different reasons, it, it never came about. And then I didn't hear anything more. And then I saw these things as well: the announcement of, of a, a Saka Messiah reunion with Tim and Harry. And, and that's about it, really. Uh, and uh, I was li- a little surprised as well because it came out in the like you say, when the virus has already started, and maybe that they didn't know how bad it's going to be, or I don't know at all. Uh, uh, and I haven't heard any official from either Tim or Harry, so I don't know if it was some kind of publicity stunt or not. Uh, to, to be honest, I'm absolutely in the in, in the black with that one. Yeah, that's weird. Now, f- from what you're getting where where you live, do you think there's going to be any festival shows late in the year, or do you think they're just it's over for for this year? Uh, for this year, I would say with all the production and all the things that needs to be done for festivals and so on and so forth, I would say that the, the 2020 is dead. Yeah, and and it doesn't and it doesn't matter if you speak about Europe, Sweden, or or the the American market or even the Latin market, it, it, it will be dead 2020, uh, and it. Right now, to be honest, if you're going to do a, a festival in 2021, uh, it needs to start to be planned right about now or, yeah. or within a month. So, so, so I think we're looking at it's going to be some time. You know, the, cra- guess. Yeah, the crazy thing that I always think about, and, and, I'm, and I'm obviously positive about it, I hope we're going to get past this, but you know, when somebody says, well, we're going to push this back to 2021, and this, gets, this happens with a lot of stuff, and then you start to think to yourself, what if 2021 is worse? Or, you know, it's like, it just, now your mind is kind of thinking about these things, like you know, something could go crazy again. You know, I've, we've never seen anything like it. Uh, but, but I, I absolutely agree with you, and we, we see some setbacks already since the parts of Europe have started to open up. And after two and a half to three weeks, they're closing down again mm-hmm. because they, they see that okay, this is getting worse again. So I don't. As long as we don't really know exactly what we're up against, I think it's going to be pretty tough. And for me, it's it's a, of course as a musician and, and and also for people that like to go to concerts, it's very bad. Right. But imagine for all these people that are making a living out of this. Uh, managements and 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 uh, festival owners and so on and so forth. This is an absolutely r- really bad slap for them. So uh, it's uh, it's going to be tough. Yeah, for sure. Well, hey, one thing people probably don't know about you that I know is that you love the wrestling videos that we do uh, where we pit the rockers against each other. Why do you like these videos so much, Zenny? Well, I think they're absolutely hilarious because you you <laughs> you're taking the you me, you really. Uh, let's say you really put out the profile on each person there and <laughs> I think it's absolutely fantastic and you love to see those but when you put characters in a different environment because you see these guys as rockers rock stars whatever and all of a sudden you see them in the ring as wrestlers so that that's absolutely funny to me and it's absolutely fantastic and I and th- those sometimes cheap lines but sometimes just absolutely great lines that you have uh, I, I find it hilarious I really, really like it well, man, I'm so glad that you get a kick out of them, and, and as I make more, I'll make sure I send them your way. Well, you know, I really enjoy them, so keep them coming, and, and again, to see these guys in different environments, and you know, put the things that, you know, sometimes people have beefs with people like, you know, Sebastian Bass have beef, beefs with a lot of people. Sure. But when you put that in the ring and everything like that, it, I think it's absolutely cool. It's it's funny. It's really good. So so please keep them coming, because it's really... and. And you're, you should put them out there. People should really see this because this is really great fun. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Well, hey, uh, anything you want to say to everybody out there before we close? Well, you know, stay safe, uh, stay cool, and, you know, the rock will be back again. And uh, I hope to see you in the future. And, uh, you know, check out whatever Shaka Messiah is going to do. And please check out my new stuff when it's coming out as Zinni. And it will be sometime around next year. So, uh, And you guys take care as well. All right, man. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Zinni. Have a great day, brother. Well, the very same to you, man. Stay safe. Take care. Yep. Take care, man. Bye. Bob, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing, brother? Great to be here, Mike. I uh, I cannot believe I'm finally uh, talking to the legend himself. <laughs> no, I think it's the other way around, man. You're the legend, <laughs> and uh, it's funny. You know, it's funny because all, a lot of us guys on Twitter, we like said we've we've been bullshitting about music for years. And then, uh, you know, here it is, but we've never actually 
spoken, you know, on the phone or ever met each other. Right. So, this, so this is cool, man. This is an event. This is really cool. This is nice. Uh, it's good to have a. It's good to have a forum to uh, connect with uh, fellow, you know, fans, metalheads. Yep. Eighties uh, hair, eighties hair metal guys, whatever you want to call it. You know, whatever you want to put the label on. You know, it's uh, it's it's a cool way to connect. So your site posts obviously a lot of Kiss stuff. Uh, and and you are you are really like a kiss guru because people will come to you. You'll get. I mean, I've seen it because obviously we follow each other. Random people will just ask you kiss shit, and they just want to know the answers because they know you probably know. Um, that's yeah. got to be kind of cool, right? To be like a kiss resource to people. It, it's it's cool, and it's kind of funny too that you say that because uh, you know when I'm on Twitter, I I would think that um, you know a lot of people think, well, at least my wife, you know, at times you know, with me because she does follow the account and reads my comments just to see if, I, if I'm interacting with any female fans. Or <laughs> and, um, and I don't, I don't use it for that, but, um, there are people that do that. And, um, but it's, you know, every time I get a DM, you know, I look at it and thinking, Oh wow, I wonder what this is. And I look at it and you would think that it's, you know, girls sending me nudes or something <laughs> like that. And it's not even as sexy as it sounds. It's, it's not because it's guys asking me, Hey, uh, Peter's, bandoliers that he wore and love gun what were those made of and, you know do you know who made them and stuff just stuff like that it's the, the craziest thing and you get i get a lot of that i'll get people asking me like hey do you know this is coming out hey do you know something like this is planned and i'm like yeah, i'll be honest if i don't know i don't know and if i really know and i can't talk about it then i just can't say it sure you might yeah. get that emoji with the sunglasses that i'm so good at posting <laughs> <laughs> the cool guy. So, hey, one thing you and I like to talk about is is Kiss conspiracies. And uh, you got any that you're that you've been cooking up lately that uh, that people need to know about? What do you got? Well, I mean, it's, it's, this is this is old Kiss folklore, but it's one of my favorites because you know a lot of this stuff just you know it hasn't come out until a lot you know just more recently you know through books. Julian wrote a book about the solo albums. But the first time I was actually really curious about the timeline of these solo albums and how they actually came, you know, came to be, you know, was uh, some of these old uh, Kiss fanzines. And, you know, I was going through my old Firehouse magazines from this guy named Ron Roxburgh back in, somewhere in Canada, I really don't remember. But those were really, really good fan magazines back in the day. And I, I missed that element because I think the Internet took a lot of that away. Yep. It's, we've always been spoon-fed by the band and never corrected that somehow the Kiss 1978 solo albums came to be because of conflict in the band, you know, during the filming of Phantom of the Park. Yep. Basically, they weren't the last-ditch effort to save the band. These albums were done before they even started filming the movie. Oh, my God. Never you know, really. and again, and they, yeah, and they were negotiated into their contract in the 76-77, you know, and the funniest thing was, was Gene had his gun turned in the filming started, and I think Peter. I mean, I'm sorry. I think Paul and Ace were like really close behind. If they were, they, if they weren't done, they were almost done. There wasn't much to do. Peter's album was the only one they were worried about, that Casablanca was worried about that wouldn't make the August deadline. And again, I always found it interesting that they've never come out and said, "Well, yeah, we we did these way ahead of time. We did them before the movie." Sure, I'm not gonna you're not gonna deny that there was conflict, and mm -hmm. you know they weren't really getting along at that point. You know, during the Phantom of the Park, we all know that that's well documented. But to say that it was some last last ditch effort to save the band, you know, you, you you've heard Gene's quote. I, I, I is it uh, Kiss? Extreme close up, yeah, like, it's extreme we'll close up. Solo albums. You all we'll do solo yep. albums, you yep. know. We will do, you know, and it's like they say it so much where you're like, okay, back then I even believed it, but when I started reading fantasy, <laughs> there was there was one interview in particular with their art director, Dennis Woolock, I think I'm pronouncing that right, where he was saying he went on this interview and you know, he, he said, don't get me wrong, I'm a little bit older, but he goes, there was no way if someone really thought we would have those albums done at the end of filming Phantom of the Park. He goes, we. We, we, he said, we finished the out, we finished the movie at the, at the end of May. He goes, nobody in their right mind could get four albums done in a matter of two to three months. No he way. Just, he said, it doesn't happen. He goes, they, they were already done. And when I first read that, I was like, that's, that's insane. There's no, that, that has to be true. Because, you know, they are kissed and super kissed to a point, but four albums, four studio albums with all those guests and everything, it's just, there's no way it could have been done in two months no. after Fan of the Park. But, that's one of my favorite ones. That's always been my favorite because, again, I've always been fascinated with it because I've never heard anybody interviewed in that band of the four members, the four original members, 
that have that have, that have said anything different. Mm-hmm. They said they, those albums all became all were a result of, of conflict, you know, on the set of Phantom of the Park. The one that always gets me, and this is nothing more than just logic in my own head is the whole Mark St. John one because I just feel like, okay, you know, Mark's hand is so huge and he can't play guitar mm-hmm. anymore. So in my mind would be like, okay, we would put Bruce Kulik in for a few shows and then when the guy's hand's better, he'd come back in the band because, you know, not that far after Animal Eyes, I don't know what year he put, he did the uh, White Tiger or whatever. Yeah. So he seemed to be doing fine then. You know what I mean? So he's, did he have a little something going on with his hand? Yeah, maybe. But I think they wanted his ass out of the band. That's just the way I look at it. I can tell you this for a fact. Paul Stanley did not like him. He was uh, a shredder. Um, he didn't listen. He wasn't disciplined. Um, we all know he can't, we all, we all know the story. He can't play the same thing twice. Right. I've, I've heard that many times. Yep. Nobody speaks fondly of this guy. No. I'm not saying he's a, I mean, he's gone now and, you know, and, and everything. And, you know, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dog the guy. He's nope. got a hard life. Yep. But like you said, there was a quick turnaround to all of a sudden being white tiger right after that, you know, and his hand was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a miracle that his hand was healed <laughs> and he was ready to go. And the, the, the bottom line is that that gig was always, was always going to be Bruce's no matter what. Yeah. They clicked with Bruce. Bruce was a team player. That's what they want. Kiss want guys. They want to surround themselves. They want to surround themselves with team players. That's yep. why do you think Kiss today is so successful? Exactly. You've got Eric and Tommy. Now some will say, "Well, they're yes men. They're employees." You know what? Say whatever you want about those guys. Granted, they're not the original guys. They wear you know the spaceman, Catman makeup, but they're team players. Yep. And that's what Gene and Paul want. Look how happy they all look on stage. Yeah. And honestly, you look out in the crowd, it's a very small margin of people that really care. It's, right. you know, Tommy wearing aces makeup yeah. or whatever. The funny thing is that, you know, I hate to keep going back to the extreme close-up, but when you said the story about the, the solo albums, I remember him saying, well, I'll do solo albums, okay? And then yeah, I think about, right. Mark comes in, his hand's blown like a, a balloon. And I'm thinking like, man, was that whole extreme close-up like a bunch of bullshit? <laughs> Was it all? Was it, it all? Really was. The kiss narrative? Is this what it is? It was a script like nothing. It was, it was a script, you know. And, and, I, and again, I would love to see outtakes of that because I'm sure that they exist. I just think it's just it really. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Kiss, but I like the depth of Kiss too. Yeah, every band has that, you know, that depth to them where you're like you get that geeky part where you want to know more. You just don't want to. You don't want to just read the. You know the Reader's Digest version of their history or whatever. You really want to, you know, dive into it. And a lot of bands are like that. But I just always found it funny, and especially with Julian Gill's solo book. If you read it, you know, and and, and you get timeline, you get interviews with these musicians. It's really interesting, and it completely crushes the myth that these albums were. You know, they they left they left the set of Phantom of the Park at the end of May and they were in the studio the next day and those albums were pumped out in September. Everything was ready to go. There was a million, millions and millions of dollars behind marketing those albums. Oh, yeah. There's no way they would have been done in, in that short amount of time. No way. No way. No man. way. Well, hey, man, it was a pleasure talking with you. Let me give the tag. It's at Bob underscore Robert Nash on Twitter. You got to follow this account. This is where you're going to get all your awesome KISS information. Appreciate the time, Bob. Thanks, Mike, and uh, talk to you on Twitter soon, man. You got it, brother. Have a good night. Well, Stevie, welcome back to the 80s Glam Metal Cast, man. It's been a while. How you been? Hey, Mike, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad here. Awesome. Well, when we talked, uh, it was January, and... A lot has happened since January, man. The world's like a different place since then, you know? Oh, God, tell me about it, mate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's gone to, well, I was going to say shit, but it has. It's gone to pot, you know what I mean? It's, yep. Everything's changed, and uh, I don't know if I'll ever go back to where I was, you know? No, I don't know, man. It's, re- it's pretty crazy. Uh, when we last spoke, you were thinking about doing some new music, but is this kind of... Uh, put a kibosh on all of that, or what's going on? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I've um, well, there's not much you can do, you know, with uh, isolation and uh, this three meter rule and all the rest of it. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's messed everything up. I, I would imagine for a lot of people as well, not just me. Yeah, definitely. Well, when we talked, uh, that story went pretty viral. Uh, a couple rock websites picked it up. Brave Words was one of them. I think even Burn in Japan picked up the story. So people are still interested, man, in hearing about Stevie James. That's that's pretty exciting, right? 
Uh, yeah, that's that's great, mate. Yeah, I didn't think anybody gave a toss, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, excellent. I didn't realise that. So what have you been doing with yourself? You've been just, uh, I know you got a new dog. What else have you been doing during this time? Uh, you know what, mate? Because I, I've got diabetes, so like I told you, type 1, I'm, I don't go out very much, you know? I'm a bit, I'm not paranoid, but uh, I just stay safe, basically. Not housebound, but uh, apart from walking my dog, you know? So I've got a new, new rescue dog here, so he, uh, he keeps my mind busy and uh, gets me out into the fields and stuff. So that's about it, really, you know? Yeah, you've been listening to any good music or what? Yeah, I've been listening to quite a lot. I've been going back to my youth a lot. A lot, posting a lot of stuff. I was listening to uh, the first Aerosmith album just yesterday, you know. Brings nice. back a lot of memories. And I've forgotten how good that album really is. Yeah. You know what's cool? And you probably can relate to this. There's some times where you'll hear a song that you've heard a million times and you're just like, oh, you know, I'm so sick of this song. But sometimes you can kind of go back to like hearing it for the first time again and getting back those feelings from when you were a kid. And when you can do that, that that's an awesome vibe right there. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I do it a lot, you know. I, my, my go-to album is uh, Aerosmith, Toys in the Attic. I just mm -hmm. love it, you know. And basically it just reminds me of being a kid, no cares in the world, and, uh, you know, it was just really good. Now, one band that I didn't realize that you were really into, and I'm into a lot too, is Angel. Uh, talk a little bit about Angel. How'd you get so big into those guys? Oh, God, yeah. I've been, been into Angel since I was a kid, man. I remember uh, I was going to see Mahogany Rush for the first time in, uh, in the UK. This was back in the, I guess it was 77. And uh, I went to a second-hand record store, and uh, I think that was the first... I maybe bought the Angels, uh, Angel albums before that, but... Yeah, I've been into them since uh, 76, 77. First record I bought of theirs was Hell of a Band. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I, I think it's their best album and I love it, you know, the fortune and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, was it hard to find some of their albums in the UK or was it? did you have to get some imported? Or No, it was uh, a lot of their stuff, were, well, all their stuff was released on Casablanca UK. Okay. So it, it was quite easy to get, yeah. Not, not difficult at all. But I always like the American imports because you got better better stuff with it. You know, we've normally got an insert and all the rest of it. So <laughs> yeah. I always used to track the American versions of everything, really. Well, nobody could touch the Kiss albums with the inserts. I mean, that was ridiculous. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My friend's a huge Kiss fan. I mean, you get all kinds of stuff in there, you know, posters and uh, and whatever. But, um, yeah, some of the Angel albums I got from Japan were really nice as well with the posters and stuff. Yeah, the one that I always liked, uh, my favorite, I think, is On Earth As It Is In Heaven. Because I just like that poppier stuff. I know you like heavier stuff. I think I gravitate to the pop stuff more. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird album for me because I kind of, um, I remember buying that. That came with a poster, by the way. And uh, I remember buying it and I wasn't that blown away by it. But the more I listen to it later on now, if I go back to it, you know, there's some great track, White Lightning's on that, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Some really good shit. Yeah. Yeah, when I talked to Punky Meadows, one thing that he said is they didn't want to ever make the same album again. So that's why you can go from the first album, it's a little bit heavier prog rock, and then when you end with Sinful, you get a real, really just a straightforward pop album. You know, they just said they didn't want to make the same album twice, and I don't think they ever really did. I, I can kind of see the differences on each album. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, the first album is, yeah, like you say, it's, it's very prog. Um, Hell of a Band is it's progression from that. Simple's it's like a commercial record, really, yep. isn't it? You know, you've got that cheap, tricky kind of wild and hot. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 Simple I like, but it's not my favourite, no. You've been uh, writing any songs during this downtime? Yeah, I've got a few ideas. I've been talking to my friend about it because he's got a home studio, you know. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, we, like we were saying earlier, it's just difficult with all what's going on to even think about going in and, and doing anything. But, um yeah, I've I've got some I've got some great ideas, but you know, putting them down is uh, is difficult at the moment because yeah. I don't I don't have the luxury of uh, any kind of home studio, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's that the the couple of AOR tracks I did for that um, that project that's uh, I think it's coming out in in the next few months. So I'll send you the two songs on there. You know, it's uh, it's not what my normal stuff, but uh, they sound pretty good now. They've been finished. I mean, they're just waiting to be released. Oh, good. But yeah. I'll definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'll send you those over. You might like them, actually. It's, uh, 
I mean, they're great songs. Uh, I think they were, the, the two I did were written by Van Morrison's ex-wife, I believe. And, uh, yeah, she writes great songs. So I'm, I'm quite chuffed with how they've come out. So I definitely will get those across to you, and you can let me know what you think. Yeah, definitely. Please do, man. Well, hey, Stevie, stay healthy, man. Good to catch up with you again. And you, Mike. Listen, stay safe, and all the best to you and your family, mate. Thanks, brother. Well, Richie Rich, welcome to the 80s Glam Metalcast, man. Nice to be talking to you. How you doing, Mike? It's nice to talk to you, too. Yeah, man, we've been BSing on Twitter for quite a few years. You know, this is cool, right? Yeah, you know, and it's funny you say that because it has been a few years now. Time's flying. Let's give your Twitter tag. It's uh, at... 1967 rich so this what, yeah. how many followers you got now because your twitter's gro- growing pretty good yeah i think i got about uh five thousand five hundred but so, somewhere in there but nice. a little over five thousand yeah at 1967 rich hey little did i know you know that there was a whole rock and roll community out there from the you know from from the late 60s and you know, stuff i like starting from the late 60s you know, the 70s, 80s, uh, into the 90s. You know, little did I know it was all out there, you know, and I got on Twitter. I didn't know when there. I'm like, how does Twitter work? You know, what do you, what do you talk about? What do you do? I came across somebody talking about Van Halen, and um, I posted that ticket stub that you've seen me post a zillion times, the 1981 Fair Warning Tour ticket stub. I posted a picture of that, like, hey, look at this concert I went to. And people took notice. I'm like, whoa, this is kind of cool. I'm you know, getting a bunch of likes here. I'm getting some followers. And it kind of just, you know, kind of built from there. Well, you know what's funny is that people that like this kind of genre of music to the level that we do, we are kind of like a secret society or something like that. Because you can't just talk to your coworker at work about, uh, you know, Pretty Boy Floyd or, uh, you know, uh, any of these guys. They won't know what the hell you're talking about. But it is cool when you get on there. I mean, like I said, you discover new things. You know, somebody will be on it. There's been times where, like, you know, you're you're big into Y and T, and I've never got much into them. I say like, hey man, fire me off some Y and T. It's cool because you'll get somebody who's really into something, and maybe will expose you to something that you just never got into. It is. It's it's a cool place to learn about bands, BS about music. That obviously the regular world that's out there, they don't know anything about it. You know. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned. You know, I you know, I can't talk to my coworkers about music because, I mean. All the bands that the we, you, we, all the we, all the bands we know about. My coworkers have never heard about UFO. My coworkers <laughs> have never heard of uh, Saxon, Y and D. You know, I, I work for a utility company. You know, that we do construction work, so it's not a, a you know, there's not a lot of hard rockers around. Here. Yep. Yeah, that, that know about the kind of stuff that you know that that uh, we listen to, whether it's popular stuff, obscure stuff, you know, that sort of thing. So that's funny, man. You mentioned your ticket stubs. You, you got to tell about some of these bands that you've seen right when they were getting going. Because I know you saw Motley Crue really early. Who are some of the guys you saw real early out of the gate? Okay, so um, luckily my parents were really cool. And they let me start going to concerts by myself at 13. Wow. Uh, they took they took me to see Kiss in 1979 on the Dynasty Tour. My mom and dad took me. And, um, you know, we got lucky. We got fortunate um, because it was raining when we got to, it got to the Cow Palace. It was a huge line. You know, my, both my parents were working. So, you know, we, we get there. The line's enormous. It's raining. And uh, luckily, some, uh, some gentleman saw my mom, you know, with her umbrella all screwed up in the rain, gave us, uh, gave us cuts in line. And we got halfway decent seats. Um, so it was really cool in there seeing my dad yelling, you know, we want Kiss, we want Kiss when the lights went down, you know. But, yeah, so a Kiss in 79, a year later, my mom took me and three friends to see Van Halen in 1980. Now that, um, you know, I, you know I, I don't know, when people say this changed my life, this changed my life, I mean, I can't really say it, it, it changed my, I guess you could say, my, my, my musical life, uh, that Van Halen concert, because the Kiss concert, as, as great as it was, there was a zillion kids my age there, you know, there was a ton of little kids and stuff, and you know, at the Van Halen concert, I was the littlest kid there. And, you know, there's people drinking Jack Daniels, there's people smoking, you know, smoking pot, people getting arrested. And I'm like, holy fuck, I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And then, uh, you know, David Lee Roth on stage acting like the rock god that he is. He's drinking, he's smoking on stage. <laughs> and, um, you know, that kind of, that, that was in October of 1990. Van Halen came back around in uh, June of 81 so i'm not good with math what's that eight nine months i mean mm-hmm. that's unheard that was even back then i'm thinking holy smoke they're coming they're coming back around and that june 81 show that's the one my mom let me go by myself for that one. she's like me 
and three friends. Uh, she well, she but me and she took three of my friends, dropped us off there in front of the old Coliseum. Uh, little old me, twerping 13 years old at uh, the Van Halen concert. Nice. And supposedly that was the show, June 12, 81. Supposedly that was the show that they filmed the videos at. So, and you've seen my, you've seen me tweet that a hundred times. I, I was at the show where they filmed the video. This my ticket stuff <laughs> for the hundredth time. You know, so, but yeah, that, um, I saw Ozzy with Randy Rhodes. Um, I saw, you had some Hawaiian King Motley Crue. That was a great one. Uh, Halloween 1982 at the Punker Pavilion. And um, that was a really good one, man. Motley, they, Motley was great, they, but they did, they looked out of it on stage, man. They, just, they must have had something funny before the show. But, but it, it, hey, that's a great bragging rights concert that I went to there. And from there, man, I just started going to all the, you know, all the shows. You know, Judas Priest, Scorpions, ACDC, Black Sabbath, um, you know, Y&P. Uh, you name it, uh, May- Iron Maiden. Whatever came to town in the '80s, I most likely went and saw it. Um, it, it I mean, it, it, those those were the days, man. Those I know, the man. Days that they can't be replaced. They can't. You know, it's it's too bad. But you know what? That's why you know, and that's why we do what we do on online. You know what I mean? We try. We're trying to keep it alive, and we just want to talk with people who like it. So I think it's I think it's fun what goes on on Twitter. It's good stuff. Yeah, hey, like we were saying earlier, who who would we have to talk to this stuff about? <laughs> who would we have to? Hey, who would I have? Who would I be able to talk to and, and have a friendly debate about if Creatures of the Night was a better album than Look It Up, <laughs> or if Look It Up was a better album than Creatures of the Night? If you had that, uh, we mean you had that little friendly debate going on for a few years now. Um, and you usually, uh, usually people are more on your side uh, with Creatures coming out on top by a by a hair. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what it is, man. I. I I want to love Lick It Up, but I just don't. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like, I think it's the sound quality of it. Or so, it's just got a weird, it's just got a, the whole album just has a weird vibe for me. I can't, I really can't put my finger on it. It just doesn't resonate with me. I, I like it and I appreciate it, but something about Creatures of the Night, and once again, I didn't buy it when it came out, so I can't say like, oh, I got into an 82. In 82, I was probably watching Sesame Street, you know what I mean? So I didn't get into it when it came out, but I don't know. Over the years, I think what kills me about that album, there's two things. To me, that's a Gene Simmons, Eric Carr album. The rest of the guys don't even matter on that album. Well, the guitar player, there really wasn't a set guitarist on that album anyways, but Gene's voice is just so gnarly on that one. His bass sound is killer, and Eric Carr's drums, best drums on any album for me. That's my opinion. And uh, I just those two make that album for me. Then when I feel like I get to lick it up, it's like, I don't know. Something's missing. Something's lost. If you really enjoy that piece of creatures, you don't really get it on Lick It Up. The drums are not the same. You know what I mean? They're they're definitely been neutered a little bit. Don't get don't get me wrong. That was necessary, and they be, they got a lot bigger with uh, with Lick It Up, but also because of the makeup removal. I mean, there's a whole backstory, of course. But uh, yeah, something about creatures, man. I just it just appeals to my ears more. I guess is the way to put it. Well, yeah. Well, you and a lot of other people, and you know, and I mean, okay, so. You know, I mean, I always say if I'm going to pick one, it's going to be Lick It Up. I yeah. love the Creatures album. And, um, you know, because um, after the, you know, in 1979, you know, that Dynasty came out. And by that time, I was discovering Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, uh, Van Halen, ACDC, uh, Zeppelin, Rush. You know, I'm sure I could name a few others. Um, you know, Kiss was still there. But it wasn't like, you know, they were the biggest band on the planet for me like they were in 1977 and 78. Yep. Um, you know, so... But anyway, so, you know, um, but like we were just saying earlier, we got to go to the Dynasty tour. That, you know, that was a mind-blowing experience for me. And the, But 1980 rolled around on mass, you know, came out, and I'm, you know, I heard, a friend of mine had it. And I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, what? I'm like, what the heck is this? But, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, when, you, when you're 13 years old, at least myself, I wasn't going to give it much of a chance because I didn't like it. Like, you know, I don't want to say I didn't like it immediately, but I didn't hear the, I didn't hear the thundering guitars. And I didn't right. hear Gene's thundering voice. You know, and you know, in 1980, I mean, gosh, when I think of 1980, I mean, some of the stuff that came out in 80, Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, Back in Black, uh, Women and Children First, Ozzy's first album, you know, all that stuff. But anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on a kind of tangent here. I, you know, I'm probably, I, kind of, I, kind of, I kind of slipped away from Kiss and <laughs> Creatures of the Night. <laughs> Creatures of the Night is kind of what brought me back. Yep. Um, because I was like, hey, I'm like, this is, uh, this is pretty cool here, you know. Um, Rock and Roll Hell, Keep Me Coming, Danger. I'm like, this is this is all right. They kind of they kind of get back into it. Um, you know, I love it loud. War Machine. A buddy of mine insisted in our little garage band we had that we play War Machine, and um, you know, it wasn't too difficult to, to hit the notes to that song. You know, 
we couldn't do it with the attitude of Gene, but uh, but um, it's funny because talking about creatures, the one song on there, and you know, this is always raising my eyebrows. I'm probably raising my eyebrows now. The one song that never really resonated with me was the title track, and um, a lot of people say that. Yeah, me, I think it, I think for me, yeah, the whole rest of the album, I'm like, right on, this is good. I think the title track kind of strayed away from the Kiss sound just a little bit too much for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's all I. That's all the only you know. That, that's the only way I can kind of you know put it. It just um, it just kind of you know that kind of that um, you know that it just kind of strayed away from the from the sound a little too much. And I mean, I know every band's got to change here and there. I don't want to sound the same every on every album, but um, that's really the only song. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say I skip it. But it was really kind of the only song that was kind of like, hmm, I'm not really sure about this one. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that, and everybody, I mean, that, and that's a favorite for tons of people, so yeah, I'm kind of weird like that. I sometimes, I don't, I'm, I'm, I, I don't go with the flow. <laughs> oh, I don't either. I get ripped all the time on, about shit that I say on Twitter, but I don't really care. I mean, I go with my gut, I go with my ears and whatever. If people don't like it, that that's their business. But you know what made me think when you said 1980... And don't get me wrong, I love Unmasked. Once again, I wasn't I wasn't listening to Kiss uh, when Unmasked came out. So to go back and listen to it, it's great. I love it. It's a great album. I, I realize it's a pop album. But you're right. When you compare it all to, to all those albums that were out at the time, it was really was a big fail, in my opinion. People can say they love it today, but in 1980, for them not to do a straight-up metal album with bands like Maiden and Priest and ACDC and all these guys, Van Halen, coming out with these kick-ass albums, that was a big missed opportunity, man. Big fail, really. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, you know, I want to give the guys credit. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say Gene and Paul well, and Ace, you know, uh, because they did what that I'm assuming they did what they wanted to do. I'm assuming right. that's what they wanted to do. Yeah, um, awesome, man. Uh, you know, it's you know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe as the ages went on, we kind of saw G and Paul jumping on trends. Um, at least it kind of seemed like it. Um, but in 1980, they definitely didn't jump on a trend. I mean, they no. kind of went a, a different. They kind of went a different a, to a different direction. You know, with, with a little bit of the, with the synth, yep. the keyboards on um, on unmasked, and like you were just talking about, you know, something you know, made and Judas Priest. You know the bands that were just you know get, were they were just so heavy uh, in 1980. Um, you no, know, but hey, you know they, they they did what they wanted to do, and you know it's funny. I bet if we could if we could talk to Paul right now, he would defend that album till, till the till the very end. You know, <laughs> interviews and. <laughs> No, you know what that album is, man? That album is 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 like the equivalent of the movie Rocky Three. You know when Rocky loses his edge, right? He's rich and he's out of touch, and he has to get his ass beat to get back hungry again. That that's almost like Kiss. You know what I mean? I think at that point they were rich, they were out of touch with hard rock, and they're trying to do a pop album. You know, you know, Bee Gees type stuff. Really, that I mean, that's what's infused in some of that music. You know what I mean? And uh, it just didn't, you know, it just didn't work. But like I said, not today to go back to it. Of course, I love it. Yeah. All right, brother. Well, hey, man, stay safe with your family and uh, have a good one. Hey, Mike, it's been fun, man. I'm glad we did this, and thank you for asking me to do it. I had a lot of fun. Hey, good, man. Have a good one. Well, Link, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing, man? I'm uh, doing great. It's an honor to be on your show, and I am deeply appreciative to have the opportunity to speak with you. Well, let's throw out your Twitter tag. It's at mlink with two k's l-i-n-k-k and so i got a question man are, are you the artist formerly known as hoggers does hoggers still exist hoggers does exist i don't use them as much as i had been because i came out of a closet from being a hog uh to myself <laughs> out of necessity from being shut down for whatever reasons i have no idea that's what my new handle is on that twitter but i still have access to the other one now after i clear things up with uh at Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful. You got to be careful on Twitter for sure. So, hey, man, one band that you tweet a lot of stuff about is Rock's Gang. What's so great about Rock's Gang? What makes you like them so much? From the time I picked up the album, uh, so we're going way back into, you know, like 88, they were unique. Their sound was different. Their tone was different. What they were uh, expressing lyric wise was different and it was unique um at that time it was a lot of cookie cutter stuff that the labels uh were having the bands put out these guys were completely different and i mean i latched onto 
it right away. And it wasn't a matter of their look because, you know, they had the basic look in the 80s, so, you know, and they were grouped in with the hair bands, even though they really weren't a hair band. But uh, after the, I mean, after the first song, first tune I, I listened to, I was hooked. And after that, I mean, this is one of the albums that I have that I consider I can listen straight through without skipping one tune. Very interesting group. Yeah, you know what? One thing that I always liked about them is it's it's the vocals. You know, the vocals are very distinct. They're very different. And and you're right. They're they're not your typical band. They definitely have some interesting songs, some darker songs. Uh, you know, one that comes to mind, and I think you like this one too, is is Red Rose. And from the podcast, you know, we talked to him about that, and and there was some dark. It was kind of a dark story about their guitar player that died. That was that's what that song was about. And uh, once again, just cool stuff that I never knew before I started talking to these guys. And, and that was the same thing uh, with myself. I mean, I never knew that. Uh, I mean, the guitar player's name was um, Eric Corral. I didn't realize, um, you know, the things that he was into. I didn't realize he was such extremely close friends with Kevin Steele. They don't know what actually happened to him, but it sounds pretty tragic. And the thing is, is that, I mean, like the demos that, that these guys signed, he was the one that had, you know, his name all over uh, the tunes on the first album. And um, I know Kevin had expressed that. I know at least half of them, he was the one that was uh, the primary uh, musical person behind that. And Kevin was doing all the lyrics and the other thing that i really thought was pretty interesting is that during the song he refers to carol and i had no idea that he was referring to his friend eric corral the guitarist so that blew me away and i only learned that from listening to uh the podcast you had with kevin uh like five months or so ago yeah so that was interesting that was a that was a fun one and and you know what kind of blows my mind is that you know a lot of cool stories going kind of long. We get to the very end of the podcast, and, and I got to drop the bomb because, you know, I want to get on Blabbermouth and all that shit. And I said, hey, man, I go, would you ever get back together with Rock's Gang? And he's like, no, man, all these rockers, these old rockers are disgusting. You know, throwing out names like Stephen Percy and Stephen Tyler. These guys are disgusting. And I was just like, whoa. <laughs> I didn't expect that to come out of his mouth. So I tell you, man, there's times I get blown away by some of the shit that comes out. Oh, well, it, it, it's funny. I, I read a, uh article on Sleaze Rocks. I think it came out about five years ago. He didn't come out and say the same stuff uh, that he did on your podcast, but he was like, you know, he's basically over the Rocks gang uh, type of thing. And, I mean, I understand where he's coming from regarding, you know, at his age, he doesn't want to be singing, you know, too cool for school. True, yeah. Um, he doesn't want to dress up and, you know, use the eyeliner and all that stuff. But the thing is, is that you don't have to dress up like that. You can just dress up like you are now as uh, uh, the Mojo Guru lead singer and incorporate, you know, maybe the songs that aren't, you know, like that. Like, I don't know if he would sing Scratch My Back, but like Red Rose has nothing to do with talking to uh teenage girls which is what he was referring to <laughs> right and the other thing that came to mind that kind of blew me away because you know again i understand where he's coming from he's growing as an artist and he's older um more mature but i'm sitting here thinking kiss okay now they've been around since the early 70s yeah they went without makeup for a short period of time but everyone wants them in makeup and that's what they, it's not just hanging on to the memories of when you were a little kid because they're still producing, you know, more tunes. Kevin wanted to go in a different uh, way because, you know, he grew up on the old 70s glam stuff and he wanted to get more into bluesy stuff. But a lot of the stuff that uh, was during the 80s glam metal stuff, it's all blues based. Yep. Um, but teach his own, man. I can't follow him for that. Well, man, you you said you had some interesting questions for me, and I'm usually the one that asks the questions, so f fire them off, man. Let's hear it. The first question I have is, how do you get all these high-profile uh, musicians from the genre that you and I both love? How do you make contact with these guys to get them on your podcast? Well... 
it's it's basically a lot of digging, you know, and, and it's not, it's not like I'm some kind of genius or specialist here. I mean, anyone could do it. You know, you, you hit up the uh, Facebook, the Twitter, uh, their websites, contact us, their management. So anybody can Google this stuff and, and, and poke around. It's the bargaining chip, I got to say, it's got to be the Twitter account. Now, I know myself that the Twitter doesn't necessarily, you know, it's okay, I got like over 13,000 followers. That doesn't mean 13,000 people will watch the podcast. That's really doesn't happen that way but it's a nice bargaining chip it'll be exposure to 13,000 people they like the kind of music that these people play so that's part of it another part of its persistence I tell you there was one was the one with Joe Lynn Turner and Joe I look at Joe yep. Lynn Turner as like legendary like how the hell did I crack that egg you know just like you know some schmuck like myself so what I did was you know I, I kept hitting up their uh their their Facebook page and then their manager and they would blow me off and then I'd I'd write back, and they'd blow me off. Then she was like, okay, I, I, I really appreciate your persistence. Why don't you send me the questions? So I send the questions, and I'm going to be honest with you. When you have these many gatekeepers and these and this many people blocking you and, and trying to you know stop you, you you're going to think, oh, my God, Joe Lynn Turner, man, he's probably got an attitude. This is going to be the worst interview I ever did. It was probably the best interview I ever did. He's so cool, so down to earth. He was a very nice guy, and he gave me all kinds of inside stuff I had never heard. And it was crazy because that story went viral. It went it went international. There was all these different international sites that picked it up. Blabbermouth took two stories from it, and that is the most viewed one I ever had. So can I say, did I work my ass off to get it? I did. You know what I mean? I really I really knocked at the door quite a few times where maybe some people would would give up. And maybe that's where I am able to get the interviews because I'm persistent. But then you also can use you can leverage the other people you've talked to. So you know what I mean? You go to Jewel Intern and you say, well, I talked to, you know, I don't even know what interviews I had done at that point. But you know what I mean? I just start throwing names out. I talked to guys in TNT. I talked to guys from, from this band. And then I think people start to say, well, okay, maybe this guy's legit. So that's how, that's how it goes. Yeah, I was going to say, you must be real persistent. The other thing that I think is really amazing, and I don't know how you came up with this, uh, is, you know, coming up with the thing uh, on your YouTube channel. I mean, I know you get the metal cast mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, the podcast with all these great artists. The beatdown thing is great <laughs> uh, regarding pitting heavy metal guys or glam metal guys that are prominent that you know have riffs with each other, whether it was, you know, way back in the day with Axl Rose and uh, Vince Neil. And you got them in the ring, and it's like watching WWE. And actually, my <laughs> wife loves it. I showed her the Sebastian Hawk one uh, the last night with Jericho, and uh, she was all over it. <laughs> so how did you come up with that concept? I know you have your kids helping you yep. with that. You had mentioned yeah. that to me. But how would you come up with, with the concept of the beatdown? Okay, so yeah, totally. Got to give my kids complete credit. And I'll tell the story of how this all started. So my kids, what they did, and they created a small sensation at their school. They would put the the teachers against each other in these matches. This is how it started. So what they do is they they take pictures off of, I don't know where the hell they get them, maybe off the teacher's Facebook. So I think stalking, you know, come, it's in the family. So so they get pictures off Facebook of the, of the teachers. Then they put the faces, they wrap them on the wrestlers, and then they make outfits that, you know, that fit the, the look and everything. So they are the ones that started it. And my son, my oldest son, is oh, his goal is to get into like commentating and all that kind of stuff. So, so they were doing that on their own. So, not very creative, Link. I gotta tell you, I'm just everything that I do on social media is 80s glam metal, 80s glam metal. So, so if, why can't 80s glam metal do uh, wrestling? So, basically, just took that same kind of concept, took took the rockers, threw them in the same thing that that those guys were already doing. So, really, I just stole their idea and built off of it. The only thing that I do that's probably a little different than they ever did is all the I know all the songs. And I use the songs as references to moves and all that kind of crap. But uh, yeah, no, totally them, man. That's where I got the idea from. And, and it's a great idea. And as you say, the references that you have regarding uh, adding them in with your commentary, the names of the tunes from the, the various bands or the guys, is actually it's awesome. I mean, if someone doesn't listen to a particular band, it's probably going to go over their head. <laughs> yeah, but, right. Yeah. Uh, the way you incorporate it is. Awesome. I know that you are you are younger than I am, and mm-hmm. probably during the heyday of the '80s, I'm assuming you were probably like eight to ten years old. 
if I've got this accurate. Uh, yeah, um, well, I'm 44. I'm 44. You, right. So you're, you're like 12 years younger than I am. Mm -hmm. And how did you get into this genre of, of music? Because most people like that are in your age group. It already passed them by. They were into the grunge stuff. Uh, what attracted you to the, to the glam metal stuff? Well, I think it just comes down to maybe just being like an old what do they call it? like being like an old soul or something like that i i i got into music really young so i started mtv was on and i i gravitated to all the hair metal stuff probably at an early age like 10 years old I mean, which sounds crazy people might not believe it i don't really care if they do or they don't but i, I mean i saw my first concert i saw was motley Crue and white snake in 1987 i was 11 so i got into it really early i had older cousins that would give me records like they would give me rat out of the cellar they gave me shout at the devil Van Halen, 1984. So, like, late, you know, mid to late 80s is when it started for me, you know, by about 10. So then when grunge and all that stuff came out, and I'm not going to lie, I bought that stuff. I played in bands. We played it. I played Smashing Pumpkins. I played Nirvana. I played all that stuff, you know what I mean? And I don't have a problem with it. But I was always, I got, I got into the hair and the hard rock stuff first. So that's what kind of stuck with me, and and then when you know when it was all over, all the grunge. I mean, I, I never gave up on the hair metal, and then I think it just got stronger as I got you know older, and I, I kept thinking back to those early days in my life, and I was like, oh, that, that, that that's the music that sounds good to me. Because if you put on Nirvana or, or some of those now, I don't know, man. It just doesn't it, you know it doesn't sound good to me. I don't I don't want to sit around and listen to it. But all the CDs that I have in my car, they're all going to be from, you know, 1985 to 1992. That's about, that's, that's the, that's the run for me. So. All right. And I, I mean, I get that. I just remember when I heard, um, Teenage Spirit from Nirvana and I was like, what is this? Because in the eighties, I mean, I was in my prime twenties and it was like, everything was over the top. I was able to go out to the LA strip the whiskey, Gazaris, and all that stuff, and see all these bands, and it was like a big party, and everyone was having fun, and then all of a sudden, you know, you get, not that these bands are bad, I mean, they're talented in their own right, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Bush, and I mean, I could go on and on, but it turned from everything was fun, uplifting, over the top, let's have a party and enjoy ourselves, to everything sucks. Yep. And I was like, what the hell happened? I mean, I know a lot of it was self-inflicted uh, uh, on the glam metal that I like, but I was like, I just went from having a great time to being completely depressed with the music that's coming <laughs> out. I mean, I don't, I don't get it. All right, man, Link, it was a pleasure, man. And, hey, we got each other's numbers. Text me, call me anytime. All right, Mike, likewise. Pleasure speaking with you. Have a great evening and take care of yourself. Be safe up there. Yeah, man, you too. Well, hey, that's a wrap for the 50th episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast. I just want to tell everybody, thanks so much for watching, for sharing, for subscribing. Couldn't do it without your support. I also want to thank all the rockers who have been guests. I couldn't do it without them either. So, hey, hopefully we'll do 50 more. Rock on!